Are you one of the people who live to envy the American fashion style? But before we talk about that, do you know where American fashion originated? Most accounts of American fashion start in the early 1600s, when French colonialists adopted attire from Europe, the continent of their birth. These tales, however, leave out the history and downplay the profound influence Native American fashion had on later generations of designers. Native American clothing varied from tribe to tribe, celebrating regional identities and resources in ways most sustainable fashion brands would envy. But that's not all. There's more that we will cover in this video. Hello and welcome back to our channel. In today's video, we will look at the history of American fashion. Do you know some of the factors that influenced American fashion? Who are some famous designers born from the growth of American fashion? Stay tuned and don't touch that dial. Please subscribe and turn on the notification bell if you haven't done so already. And with that, let's get this party started. The Native American fashion clothes included the ornate patterns of Sioux war shirts and the intricate patchwork of breech cloths. Tribes were forced into closer contact with one another and started to adopt each other's traditions as they were expelled from their ancestral territories through colonization. Feather headdresses and fringed buckskin clothing, the latter of which became part of the cowboy's uniform, and consequently, of white American clothing, are what we typically connect with Native American fashion as a result of the eventual merging of these two forms. The interaction between the old and new world trends has developed in tandem with the country's growing diversity. As a result, American fashion should not be seen as a continuation of Eurocentric fashion, but rather as a body of work that incorporates a wider range of voices and influences. Let's see how that is the case. The Gilded Age Money is one of the influences of fashion with all its obscene and consumerism-related connotations. Industrialization upended the traditional hierarchies that were restrained by feudal sumptuary laws. The likes of Elva Vanderbilt, the granddaughter of Cornelius Vanderbilt, challenged the old money by showing that status could not be bought as she even surpassed her old money rival, Mrs. Astor, in public renown and social prestige. Thanks to the development of photography and the expanding influence of the press, Elva Vanderbilt used a media frenzy surrounding her picture to overthrow her adversary and demonstrate the superiority of gained money over the inherited estate as culture became more visually oriented. The key to this charade was the garments the new money industrious treasured as essential to their opulent look, while the ancient artists scorned them as needless trifles. The ostentatious family sense of dress is described in almost comical detail in Anderson Cooper's book. Elva would combine several outfits to court attention, including yellow and white brocade gowns, underskirts in deep orange and pale butter, a velvet tiara with peacock, and hand-worked blue satin bodices embellished with gold beading. She even wore a strand of pearls that belonged to Catherine the Great over her waist. Consuelo Vanderbilt presented herself as a full-fledged European princess. She resembled the Statue of Liberty as she was holding a torch in her right arm fueled by a hidden battery. Some of the most iconic Gallic costumes may even be interpreted as overt references to golden grandeur. Katy Perry's Machino 2019 Met Gala chandelier dress has an uncannily Vanderbilt feel. Internal Recognition Although gilded glamour in its purest form eventually faded, the public awe and demand for great fashion that period helped to establish have never diminished. It has, if anything, become stronger and spread beyond American society's elite classes. The International Best Dress List was established in the 1940s by American fashion publicist and New York Fashion Week creator Eleanor Lambert as a result of the development of event photography in the 20th century. It was a brilliant concept to recognize the competitive nature of getting dressed. Lambert would eventually co-organize the Battle of Versailles, an actual competition that would contribute to the international recognition of American fashion. The competition that was held on November 28, 1973, matched the top five French designers. Yves Saint Laurent, Hubert de Gavinci, Pierre Cardin, Emmanuel Ungaro, and Marc Bohan for Dior against five American designers, Halston, Bill Blass, Anne Klein, Stephen Burroughs, and Oscar de la Renta. Every designer showcased her collection in front of the world's social elite, including Andy Warhol and Princess Grace of Monaco. The American designers won the night as their shows erupted with vitality, color, and a distinct brand of modernism lacking in the more conventional French creations. 
American fashion started to be exported and wasn't just for high-end formal wear. Levi Strauss invented blue jeans in the United States more than a century earlier. Still, they had already gained popularity in Europe and markets far beyond their working-class American origins. As a result of the glamorization of sportswear, the line between casual and sophisticated styles has recently loosened due to the American style. This style development at the time encouraged European couturiers to introduce more approachable, ready-to-wear collections. By founding his Rive Gucci store in 1996, Yves Saint Laurent, a big fan of the blue jean, began democratizing high fashion in France. It embraced the left bank of the science countercultural, youthful, and creative atmosphere at the time, which was more Sartre than sartorial. Saint Laurent's store served as a chic link between the left and right banks and between cutting-edge, experimental designers like Sonia Reichel and venerable couturiers on the Rue des Faubourg Saint Honore. In the New York fashion world of the 1990s, this bridge would find its American analog two decades later. International fashion designers started to pay attention to New York City as the nation's sartorial core as American fashion began to permeate worldwide. Designers from Japan, Italy, and Great Britain found a growing following among cosmopolitan Americans with the opening of stores like Sharavari, founded by the Weiser family on the hitherto unfashionable West Side. John Lennon and Yoko Ono took a keen interest in Japanese attire in the Sharavari store. Experimentations American and European fashion conversations continued the interaction between those two continents' visual arts. Both discussions rewrote beauty rules and rethought what might be deemed original, opulent, and priceless. Ralph Lauren was a key player in this dance as he did a better job than any other British designer. Then some designers had political clout with their cultural adaptations. Designer Patrick Kelly, who is black, combined surrealistic viewpoints with satirical racist iconography. In 1989, he created t-shirts with stereotypical images of black guys, which was a risky move for a high fashion runway. It was a potent reclaiming act, proving that fashion can fuel political dialogue. Infusing design with a sense of humor, Kelly helped pave the way for the 1990s, which would become the heyday of American fashion. Thanks mainly to the emergence of downtown Manhattan as a fashion hotspot, it was a decade that solidified New York's position as a significant worldwide fashion hub comparable to Paris, Milan, and London. Previously unfashionable, now unaffordable, Soho saw the appearance of shop fronts bearing new names and bright young things like Todd Oldham and Isaac Mizrahi inspired a new hunger for innovation among established designers like Donna Karen, Ralph Lauren, and Calvin Klein. They were trying to remain relevant to a younger clientele. Klein, who had spent most of the 1980s designing colorful, handsomely cut clothes for Amazonian bodies, embraced a darker, more minimalistic aesthetic. This marked the beginning of an industry-wide shift towards authenticity, vulnerability, and almost haunting realism. This new standard was embodied by a teenage girl from Croydon. She was Kate Moss. The new fashion trend wasn't without critics, however. Many people objected to Klein's campaign with a naked moss as they were seen glamorizing a heroin-chic appearance. Hamish Bowles asked, Could a rejection of fashion be high fashion? Accepting a new mood required a risk, but it was a risk that frequently paid off. Mark Jacobs' AW 1993 Perry Ellis presentation embraced the shabby, worn-in looks taken from Seattle streets. In his interview with Bowles, Jacob summarized his style as consisting of Doc Martens, small shrunken cardigans, and beaded slips. He received scathing reviews from Susie Menkes and was dismissed from Perry Ellis. It was a show that made his career. Jacobs was a member of a young generation of fashion designers that questioned conventional notions of style with increasingly untailored and frequently androgynous creations. The Chinese-American designer, Anna Sui, a stylist for photographer Stephen Meisel for a significant portion of the 1980s, is one of the most iconic names to emerge from that new generation. Sui created an empire out of her teenage dream by fusing post-punk attire with pastel colors and sending her model friends down the runway in baby doll dresses to the sounds of Pearl Jam and Smashing Pumpkins. Sui adopted the more carefree, uncurated approach to design pioneered by her peers. 
Stylists and consumers alike are looking to Sui's handmade savoir faire for inspiration as modern society enjoys a resurgence in interest in crochet and thrifting as a part of a larger movement to support sustainable practices within the fashion industry. That's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed knowing what influenced American fashion. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. Until we meet again, bye!